Good evening, doctors. My name is Dr. Aishwarya, and I welcome you all for today's Surgical Herald webinar. Infections at or near surgical incision within 30 days of operative procedure can cause infection, can lead to infection sometimes. And this infection is to contribute to surgical morbidity and mortality each year. And that said, prevention is of crucial importance. With that kept in mind, for today's webinar, the topic is current concepts to prevent surgical site infections. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome our speaker, Dr. H. V. Shivram sir, and our moderator, Dr. C. S. Rajan sir. Dr. C. S. Rajan sir is a senior consultant surgeon from Bengaluru. Sir has affiliations with Annaswami Mudalya General Hospital, Malia Hospital, Vikram Hospital, and Columbia Asia Hospitals. Sir is a dedicated teacher and guide for DNB in general surgery for over 30 years. GC member ASI 2010-2015, chairman Karnataka State Chapter of ASI 2016-2017, editorial board member Indian Journal of Surgery 2019-2024, inspector assessor, appraiser, examiner, and examination coordinator for NBE New Delhi. Local, state, and national level surgical quiz master for past 18 years with over with 12 publications. I now request our moderator, Dr. C.S. Rajan sir to take over the session. Good evening, everybody. And thank you, doctor, for that kind introduction. We are dealing with a very mundane and common topic, but of great relevance and importance in our surgical practice. The surgical site infection. It's something that every surgeon wishes never would happen to his cases, but it does happen. There are various reasons for this, and that is what we will go through this evening. We have, um, you know, reasons that are related to the three T's. The three T's being the technique and its goodness or its failure, the team or the hospital environment in which this happens, and very small percentage is contributed from the patient in terms of tissue failures. So. There's a lot that can be prevented. And for us to take us through this prevention, we have none other than Dr. H. V. Shivaram. He's a senior consultant surgeon. He's the head of surgery and allied specialities and a program director at the leading corporate hospital of Bangalore, the Asta CMI Hospital. He's also a member of the Executive Council of the Association of Surgeons of India and the member of the Obesity and Metabolic Surgery Society, Surgery Society of India, a good teacher, examiner, and accredited by the National Board of Examinations, and written several papers of this interest. Why he is important to us today is because he's a classical general surgeon, and gone on to the specialization of minimal invasive surgery, and he knows all about both sides of the fence, both aspects of surgery. So before, without wasting much more time, I'm very proud to introduce to you, Dr. H. V. Shivaram. Kindly note, please type your questions in to the given numbers below. We have great honor and pleasure of thanking Zydus Fortiza Division and the Thombos, Thrombos Car Section who have sponsored and who are looking after us in getting this program online. So when you type in the questions, it will go to the basic website where they will be forwarded to us and we will answer them at the end of Dr. Shivaram's, uh, uh, Dr. Shivaram's talk. Till he finishes, we will not interrupt him. Dr. Shivaram, over to you, sir. Dr. Shivaram? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Dr. Rajan. It's always a great pleasure to have a senior surgeon, 
Dr. C. S. Rajan as the moderator. We always look forward for guidance from him. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Zaidas Portiza, for this invitation to talk on the most important aspect of the surgery, that is the surgical site infections and how to prevent it. I bring greetings to you from Bangalore and Astor CMI Hospital, Bangalore. This little bit of hiccup. Yes. If there is one reason why we are discussing about the surgical site infection today is because it is most eminently preventable with pre-operative and intraoperative operative measures. If you see the literature, about 40 to 60 percent of surgical site infections are preventable if we really take all the care and leave aside our casual attitude. So this is a huge number. Can you imagine 60 percent of the surgical site infection can be prevented and that is in our hand. If we can do this, this will be the greatest service to our patient community and that is where the importance of surgical site infection. Every surgeon prays for himself and also for the patient. Before we start the operation, we also pray that the invisible enemy, the microbes, do not infect my patient. So this is an important prayer and every day we do this because we don't want our patient to suffer because of the surgical site infection. We are never alone in our body. Can you imagine there are 100 trillion symbiotic microbes in our adult human body and we are coexisting with them always. They may be in the gut, they may be in our respiratory tract or the oral cavity, they may be in the external genitalia, but what is most important for us is the skin over which we put incision. The skin and the hands. The hands, if you may not realize, but they are the dirtiest part of our body. And luckily, Corona has actually educated us on our hand hygiene. We should be grateful to that. So whether these trillions of organisms which are there in our body, whether they will remain as commensals or they invade into our body and cause pathogens, whether they become friend or they become our enemy, this depends on a very delicate host balance. So if the immunity comes down, they can take a upper hand and they can become pathogens. Every major surgery is an assault on our immune system and temporarily the immunity may go down and this may be a great occasion for the bacteria or whatever commensals are there to infect the surgical site infection. As long, as ago, long ago as 1920, Moynihan said, every operation is an experiment in bacteriology how true it is, very, very true. And it's all about the surgical wound which the surgeon has to take care. Whenever we do or cut an incision on the skin, there will be some amount of contamination and bacteria enter, but it all depends on how much we take proactive care and the host immune response, how it can defend and prevent an established infection. Versus paying just $10 because I knew I wasn't going to have. Kinetics of bacterial growth. So period of contamination is always there when we operate. But if it is properly taken care of, preventive measures are there, it will not go into the infection, which usually starts in about three to five days. So ladies and gentlemen, the skin is the first line of defense 
and we should always make it our friend and not our enemy. So with this background, let us see what is surgical site infection. All of you are very much aware that any infection that occurs at the site of surgical incision within 30 days of surgery is defined as surgical site infection. If we put a mesh or an implant, then even if it occurs within one year, it is considered as surgical site infection. So what we have to remember is one month without implant, one year with implant. Classification of surgical site infection, it is taught every time. Such skin and subcutaneous tissue, if it gets infected, is superficial. If it is deep and the muscles, fascia, then it is deep incision and the organ space infection is the other type of surgical site infection. We may do an excellent laparoscopic cholecystectomy or an appendicectomy. The wound, everything may heal, but after two or three weeks later, if the patient comes back, with a subhepatic abscess at the gallbladder fossa or a pelvic abscess after an appendicectomy, that is definitely an organ space surgical site infection which requires definitive therapy. The categories of wound, we know, clean, clean contaminated, contaminated, and dirty. So there are four classes. What we are interested is mostly in clean and the clean contaminated wounds where our maximum efforts should be put to prevent the surgical site infection. Major pathogens, as I said earlier, come from the skin, whether it is staph aureus or staph epidermidis, and sometimes they can when we open the abdomen or a bowel operation, they can be from the uh, gut organisms also come, can come. So why we are talking all about this surgical site infection? It is because of the effects of surgical site infection. It can cause delayed wound healing with all its consequences. If there is a skin and subcutaneous tissue infection, if it is deep, it can cause a burst abdomen or possible evisceration and maybe later a hernia in that region. And the organ space infection can cause, as I said, abscesses, sometimes fistula, and they may require major procedures to tackle them. So it is complication and the pain and suffering of the patient we are worried and the enormous cost of healthcare, multiple hospital admissions, stays, or ICUs, and the surgeon's reputation definitely damages. No patient likes the surgical site infection. Whatever amount of convincing we do, insurance denials can occur, and it can leave bad scar, deformities, hernias, and may need corrective surgeries. So if you see the financial burden of surgical site infection, it can be direct, which can be seen always, but the indirect costs also very high in the form of impaired function, loss of productivity, and also patient dissatisfaction, and the number of referrals which are coming to you decreases, and the litigations may also involve these things. So friends, it's a very, very important patient safety aspect is to prevent the surgical site infection. Long back, Murphy told, the patient is the center of the medical universe around which all our works revolve and towards which all our efforts trend. This is a universal truth and it cannot be denied. It will be like that forever because all of us exist because patient is exist and all our efforts and all our activity revolves our, 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 around our patient. So what are the risk factors for surgical site infection? 
all of you know about it but i feel the most important is the casual attitude of our community itself i think it has the casual attitude has come from our education system itself i think there is should be fundamental change in that region so that we take even a small invasion into another human's body whether putting an incision or putting a iv line or a putting a catheter we take it very very seriously because our friend who can become enemy is waiting all the time to cause infection there are many patient factors which can be uh, turned into advantageous factors before we put our knife so before putting any doing any incision or the surgery we should spend some time and see what we can improve in this patient obviously age we cannot alter older the age there may be more chance of infection the severity of the disease or the immune compromising problems if the patient is smoking or if he is massively obese certain things we can definitely correct like the diabetes of the patient we can definitely optimize it if the patient is poor in nutrition or this albumin is low you can definitely correct it if there are remote infections in the body we can definitely treat and the hospital pre operative stay in the hospital definitely we can re reduce there is no need of admit the patient two days three days a week earlier and then operate they will definitely increase the surgical site infection best is to admit on the day of the operation in the morning and then do the surgery next coming to the surgical surgery factors many of them are or under our control some things may not be under control like an emergency operation the hair removal techniques and the site of surgery like abdominal operations have a more surgical site infection than a thyroid operation or a breast operation and the how we prepare the skin there we give a peri operative antibiotics some of this will discuss in the next slide slides whether there is any hypothermia and drains how we kept and the whether there is any glove puncture so so many things which we can take out during the surgery and including the operative room environment of course there are independent factors which may not be able we may not be able to help very much like the op abdominal operations as i said operations lasting more than 2 hours they have increased chance of surgical site infections operations performed on who have multiple comorbidities or the class 3 class 4 category of contamination that definitely will have infection so most important service we can do is take good care of our hands before we touch the patient and then see that they are taken care of our hands should not be a source of infection if you see many years ago this type of travels were very rampant either in the wards or the operation theater they are the worst and it can grow multiple types of bacteria and again this came but again this not good because we are not uh, cleaning our hands we are just drying it the best thing is to use these papers wiping papers they not only dry but also if there are some surface bacteria that can be removed so these are the things which we have to use the preventive measures against surgical site infection they are plenty and they all require lot of detailed attention so all of you know 
an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. If we can prevent something, something, why we should spend a lot of money and the effort to cure it? So there are multiple factors, pre-operative, intra-operative, and also post-operative. If you see the important pre-operative measures, so as I said, shorten the pre-operative stay as much as possible, avoid or treat remote site infection. So we should examine the patient thoroughly, the entire body, and there is a see whether there is any paruncle or something, and antiseptic shower pre-operatively. There is definitive evidence that chlorhexidine shower helps. And then pre-operative hair clipping using scissors or besties do not remove any hair, but do not use the razor or shaving methods. Antimicrobial prophylaxis, we will come to this in little detail and optimize the nutrition, pre-operative warming the patient and tight glucose control and stop smoking 30 days before surgery. So these are all the measures we have to think of before posting our patient for surgery. So you spent more time on the pre-operative preparation, the patient will spend less and also suffer less post-operatively with the surgical site infections. So what we can do intraoperatively, there are again many things we can do. We can take care of the asepsis and antisepsis. When we are doing GI cases, carefully avoid the spillage, the surgical technique, prevent hematoma, do not leave any or devitalized tissues, avoid dead spaces, ensure good perfusion of tissues, complete debridement, as I said, and the sutures, monofilament and antimicrobial coated sutures are much better than the multifilament. Avoid foreign bodies and as far as possible drains. And if there is a very bad contaminated and you are thinking of it is going to cause infection, there is no harm in leaving the wound open after closing the deep fascia and muscles and we can do a delayed wound closure. Of course, good glycemic control. Then coming to post-operative measures. So dressings are important initially, maybe about what up to 48 or 72 hours when the epithelialization gets completed. Remove drains as early as possible. Start nutrition as early as possible. Preferable is enteral nutrition, glycemic control. And this is very important. Surveillance program or infection control committee, a infection committee member or a nurse who can follow up these patients and see how they do and develop any infection. So these are some of the post-operative measures, which is very important. This putting topical antibiotic in the hope that it prevents infection has no great uh, scientific evidence. Uh, after the dressing is removed or so, we should always, whenever we see a post-surgery patient and do a dressing, it's very important that we wash our hands very thoroughly before and also after dressing. And it's always better to wear a glove and then do the dressing. It is safe for us also and safe for patient also. And sterile techniques you have to use. And also important it is to educate the patient and family regarding the in incision and the side wound care, symptoms of surgical site infection, and when they have to report back. Then 
the surgical site infection cannot be prevented only by the surgeon. So there are a lot of effort should be put by the institutions and also the hospitals wherever we are working. And they have also become very proactive. And most of the hospitals now have infection control committees. They meet periodically, supervise these cases and the preventive measures. There is definite composition, frequency of meeting, and the functions of the committee, all these are laid down. And this is one of the very, very important institutional um, initiative towards preventing infection in this surgical site infection. So as I said, surgical site infection risk is a myriad of events and it requires not the individual effort, but it requires a team effort. Whether the pre-operative factors, perioperative team factors, and organizational and management factors, the patient factors, the surgical techniques, work environment, the care delivery problems, all these things cannot be managed by one or two people or not just the surgical team. So this requires effort from the hospital management also. That's why now the importance is towards surgical care bundle approach. So what is this bundle approach? It is the structured way of improving the processes. So if you improve the processes in the hospital of the patient care, definitely the outcomes improve. So all these activities which are evidence-based can definitely improve the ultimate patient outcome and we can prevent surgical site infections. So the evidence-based surgical practices which can improve the outcomes or the need of the hour and the surgical care bundle approach definitely is a very good initiative in this direction. I said about uh, pre-surgery shower, chlorhexidine shower, it is, there is definitive way of doing it and definite instruction should be given. Two showers are important, the night before the surgery and on the morning of the surgery, one minute rinsing and application and about four ounces are required. Now there are 100 ml small bottles of 4% chlorhexidine is available. We can give it to each patient and tell them how to take shower. They should not apply it their face, rest of the area they can use it. And this is one initiative which hospitals are also doing. And it is a lot of evidence to do that. The other important thing is how we prepare the skin and we, how we scrub our hands before surgery. Two important things which are used is the povidone iodine and chlorhexidine. Both are good, but the chlorhexidine has a little bit of upper hand in this and because of its mechanism and also the spectrum of activity. The only problem is in most of the articles also they say the surgeon is not feeling happy to use chlorhexidine because they are used to this betadine color and when we scrub the patient in the OT with the chlorhexidine, even though everything is okay, that color is not remaining on the skin and the surgical surgeon's personal satisfaction is not there. That is coming in the way of chlorhexidine gluconate. But if you see the activity of the chlorhexidine, it is very good. It has persistent antimicrobial activity up to six hours. The repeat applications are much better and rapid bactericidal action and excellent activity against both gram positive and gram negative organism. And when there is blood or tissue protein spillage, the, the efficacy of this doesn't come down. 
So there are so many advantages of using fluorhexidine gluconate, both for hand scrub before surgery and also for after the, the for the patient skin preparation. Surgical site preparation, you all know that you come in concentric circles from the site of surgery and then cover all the areas, including if you are planning to put a drain or anything. So good surgical site preparation is required. This is very, very important step to prevent the surgical site infection. The one aspect is the surgical antimicrobial prophylaxis. When we were postgraduates, this was never practiced. So what we used to do in the pre-operative rounds, our, our duty was to shave the skin and give enema to the patient and prescribe antibiotics to give post-operative. So post-operatively most routine was giving ampicillin, gentamicin, and metronidazole. But it, they were all not a good antibiotics practice. There is no need to give all those things if we give a good single dose antimicrobial prophylaxis at the time of induction or about an hour before surgery. So what is this surgical antimicrobial prophylaxis? So we should not get confused this with the therapeutic antibiotic what we give for an established infection. The whole importance of antimicrobial prophylaxis is to prevent the infection when we incise the skin. So this refers to a very brief course of an antimicrobial agent initiated just before an operation, not after the skin incision. So this is an attempt to sterilize the tissues at the critical time of before the skin incision so that the intraoperative, whatever contamination occurs, will not get converted into an infection and the host defenses will take care of this. So as I said, it does not pertain to prevention of surgical site infection caused by post-operative contamination. So the entire idea of antimicrobial prophylaxis is to give this before skin incision. So let us go in a little bit of detail about this antimicrobial prophylaxis. The timing is everything in antimicrobial prophylaxis. There are a lot of studies which have said the most important timing is to give between the, within two hours of the incision. So best is, but it is very difficult to tell the nurse or somebody to give the antibiotic and send to the OT. There may be many things which can miss the dose or somebody may forget or the surgery may get delayed. So best practice has been to give about 30 minutes or 20, 25 minutes before the surgery that is best given by the anesthetist at the time of the induction of the anesthesia. So because nobody will forget and it also comes in the our surgical safety checklist and once the responsibility is given to anesthetist to give the pre uh, prophylactic antibiotics before the skin incision, it is the duty of the surgeon also to talk to anesthetist and find out whether the prophylactic antibiotic has been given or not. After the given, and if the surgery pr procedure prolongs more than three hours, we can give a redose, or if there is a major blood loss during the procedure and the antibiotic gets lost again, also we may have to redose these antibiotics. So, how to choose the antibiotic for the particular surgery? It should be of the narrowest spectrum to cover likely pathogens. So, this we will come to know usually in each hospital from the uh, 
microbiologist or whatever is the hospital policy. Avoid the high-end or therapeutic antibiotics, and there is no need to give third or fourth generation cephalosporins. And they should have a moderately long half-life and should have good safety profile. Like cefuroxime is a good choice of antibiotic for most of our surgeries. And duration. So what is the duration? I always, I also already said, single dose therapy is as effective as multiple doses in majority of studies. So longer therapy is not in indicated in most cases, but there are some exceptions. And even if you give longer than 48 hours is not beneficial at all. And just because you have kept a drain or you have kept a dune, uh, tubes or you put a catheter, there is no need to continue the antibiotic. Where you continue longer dose is one is if the patient has multiple biliary, pancreatic or endoscopic interventions and such patients you do any biliary or pancreatic surgery, already it's an infected field you may have to continue. If you do a re-explorations and patients who are cirrhotic, multiple paracentesis, there may be bacterial contamination. And of course, the immunocompromised patients. These are some of the situations where may, you may have to give a little bit of longer therapy. And always the dose has to be uh, calculated as per the body mass index. The patient of BMI, the antibiotic dose is different from the 30 BMI of a patient. So ladies and gentlemen, fundamentals of antibiotic administration is that it should be given not after skin incision, it should be given before skin incision. Probably best is to give at the time of induction and after that we have about 10-15 minutes before we start the incision. And after that only, we should put the incision and open the abdomen. Never do this without asking anesthetist. Never put the skin incision. Once the incision is made, antibiotic delivery to the wound is impaired and we should be given before incision. So this is what I am emphasizing again and again. It is like if you give antibiotic, after the skin incision, it is like opening the umbrella after the rain starts. Already we are wet. What's the point? Opening the umbrella after the rain starts and we get wet. <clears throat> Other important practice is the hair removal. The best is not to do shaving or depilating cream, all those things. They can leave some abrasions bacteria can colonize. Best is to practice is to do the AM is morning and PM is in the evening before surgery. So if you see there are a lot of studies which have said best is to do the skin clipping, the infection, surgical site infection rate is released and practice is better after induction, after the anesthesia is given, you do the shaving, and you have little time for the antibiotic also to act um, and then start the surgery. So instead of shaving or clipping in the ward, it is better done in the operation theater. So these are the things we should not use at all. They can cause, as I said, the micro microscopic damage and the bacterial colonization before we start only the infection can start. Perioperative normothermia. This is another initiative we can do. There is no great level one evidence, but definitely this is another important effort by our us to prevent surgical site infection. So what is required is the surgeon or OT needs to be cool, but patient needs to be warm. So start with a warm room, use bear hugger, 
and then you can switch off the AC and whatever irrigation saline, what we do, we can warm it. And then before extubation, we can again switch off the AC. So at the end, we have the warm patient. So cold patients have three times more infection rate than the warm patient. So most of the hospitals now use this bear hugger. They can, they warm the patient. Outside may be cool, but the patient is warm. Excellent method of warming the patient. So perioperative oxygen supplementation. Again, there is some evidence to say that it improves the tissue oxygenation, prevents the surgical site infection. This was the problem earlier, that is the drape failure when we were all using these cloths for the gown and the patient draping everything. And um, there is a two-way contamination in this. So most of the hospitals have switched over to this water repellent of uh, gowns and patient drapes. So you can see here how it can percolate and cause infection. So this is another initiative which is very, very welcome. So there are adhesive stickers, non-porous. So they are the best to prevent again surgical site infection. So dear friends, if you ask me, most of the measures of the prevention of surgical site infection, major events begins and ends in the operation theater and surgeon has a great role in ensuring these things, whether it is the temperature, blood glucose, antibiotics, how to give, hair removal, skin preparation, everything we have to go in details. Then only we can give a good post-operative prevention of surgical site infection. Lastly, there are some innovative strategies which can prevent surgical site infection. Few of them, let me just tell you. There are a lot of impregnated technologies which are uh, come to the healthcare. Even the FDA has approved many of them, whether orthopedic surgeons use a lot of these uh, implants, the, whether the, uh, their <clears throat> bone cement, many of them have the anti-bacterial uh, impregnated technologies. Whenever we put an implant, we have to be very, very careful because bacteria can colonize very easily in them and biofilm can uh, form around it. And whatever tons of antibiotics we give up to that, it will never reach the site of infection. So preventing is the most important aspect. Nowadays, we all use the triclosan-coated antibacterial sutures. This is not antibiotic-coated. This is a chemical. And this has prevented a lot of bacterial colonization. And there is an inhibition role, inhibition zone around the suture when we use these coated sutures. Most of the material coming now are the triclosan coated and it has very good safety profile and this is used in many of the things like the toothpaste, lipstick, everything. So safety profile is not a matter, but this itself cannot prevent all the surgical site infection. This is one of the measures we can do to prevent thing. We surgeons use a lot of mesh and always worried about mesh-related infections, which can occur even as late as three, four, five years later also. So we should take care that no bacteria will colonize in these implants. Every surgeon should have his, to his own strategy to prevent the mesh infection. And a vigilant surgeon is most important Never allow anybody else to touch your mesh. Only surgeon touches after the changing the glove. Least people should be there in the OT. 
there are so many precautions we have to take when we put an implant to another human being he should not suffer because of our fault and this is an iatrogenic problem which can be definitely prevented if we take all the proactive measures next coming to wound protection during abdominal surgery we all used this when we had no other things these towels mops then we shifted to plastic sheet but now we are very lucky we have these wound protectors they are very good they not only retract the wound but also protect the wound site so there is good evidence to say that in some of the surgeries we can use this it will give a good exposure there are two rings which one goes inside one goes one is outside and it retracts and also covers and protect the wound edges next coming to antimicrobial incised drapes there is no great evidence again this is another effort we can avoid touching the skin whatever bacteria are there coming to the incision site and there are some literature to say that it prevents the surgical site infection orthopedic surgeons use plastic surgeons use and uh, we have all adopted whenever we are using the mesh and all wound irrigation many of us are used to gentamicin saline irrigation povidone iodine ir irrigation to the wound not intra abdominal to the wound before closing the wound there is some evidence to say that they are good but we have to take all the precautions about the sensitivity everything another thing which can uh, bring bad reputation to surgeon is because of these two things which were introduced early during laparoscopy era the sidex chamber and the formalin chamber lot of these mobile laparoscopy units they use it very very dangerous please don't use them they are for disinfection they are okay for the gastroscopy or for the urological cystoscopy and all but definitely not for surgeons what we require is sterilization most of the hospitals have now using plasma sterilizer or at least autoclave and the etvo sterilizer is also good the problem is this is the vapors some countries have banned because this can cause carcinogenic activity so the vapors can be carcinogenic so best used to use plasma sterilizers or the autoclave please discard the sidex chambers and the formalin chambers and they should not be used for any of our sterilization they are for disinfection these are all caused by the iatrogenic problems where the mesh had to be removed otherwise it cannot be cured post lap ventral hernia mesh infection started about 6 months after the surgery mesh has to be removed laparoscopically ventral there is a large abscess here see the amount of patient suffering and the cost atypical mycobacterial infection is another big problem if you are using especially the sidex chambers there are number of patients who are suffered in the initial period of laparoscopic era so at least now there is lot of realization so we should avoid the sidex chambers and the mobile laparoscopy sets you see the orthopedic surgeons they take great care when we put an implant so they won't allow anybody inside the oti they use face suit they use all possible disposables but we the general surgeons many times we don't take the amount of care which is required when you put an implant to the patient that is the mesh so our casual attitude will cost very heavily post operative so this is one or two of the last slides role of negative pressure wound therapy in the prevention of surgical site infection not i am not talking about the therapeutic aspect it is about the preventive aspect even the 
Uh, World Journal of Emergency Surgery has recently recommended it, especially if you are doing a colorectal surgery also. If there is contamination and there is a great chance of infection, better to use this, the negative pressure wound therapy as a primary prophylaxis. And this has good evidence to say that wound infection can be prevented. So dear friends, we have a problem, the surgical site infection, which can cause morbidity, sometimes morbi mortality, and enormous health care costs. It is devastating, not only to the patient, but also to the surgeon. But what is very important is that we have solution. We have proven methodologies which can decrease surgical site infection. Only thing is we should have the will to adopt all these strategies. It doesn't matter how good the operation goes, how best is the surgeon, or how expensive and broad spectrum antibiotic you have used, or how excellent and is the healthcare facility. But what is important is the devil is in details. We have to go into all the details and our priority should be to go into the details of healthcare delivery. And if we don't do that, we are not giving our best to our patients around whom all our efforts, services, and everything revolves. So we should give utmost priority to the details of this healthcare delivery. Thank you very much. Thank you for the patient hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shivaram. That is, was a very, very uh, comprehensive approach to the problem of surgical site infection, which is always a bugbear in every surgeon's um, career. And we keep on meeting these things. And as you rightly say, it is attention to details, the smaller details that make the whole match perfect. Um, I have a few little questions for, that have come up. Um, right. One is from Dr. Ajay Kumar of Hyderabad, who wants to know that role of the biofilm, you know, that little biofilm that forms around all these foreign bodies, or sutures and staples. Is that got a role to play in the development of wound infection? Um, there are two things. Biofilm is one. It is the layer of most often staph aureus or the bacteria which forms around the implant we put. Yeah. So like if we are used a mesh and it gets infected, so a colonization of the bacteria occurs around the implant that is called as biofilm. And once this form, there is no way of treating that infection by antibiotic or any other measures except removing the mesh. Yeah. There is other thing, a thin rim of the, like a, when we use a nickloson um, impregnated suture, there is a layer of activity zone occurs around the suture, around that suture that inhibits, prevents bacterial colonization. So that is another type of bioactivity which can occur around the uh, impregnated uh, implants or the suture material. Right. Now, everybody says, once you've made a wound, give him antibiotics. Now, every wound, every surgeon uses the antibiotic as a kind of, a, you know, a, a pillow on which he could rest comfortably because he's given the antibiotic, no wound infection would occur. I would like you to just explain briefly the role of prophylactic antibiotic in the surgical site infection prevention. What is the dose and what is the ideal use and what would be the duration of prophylactic antibiotic? I'm not talking of contaminated wounds. 
I want two situations. One is a clean surgery with no implant. And the second is a surgery where an implant has been used. Prophylactic antibiotic, please. Yeah. I dealt, uh, dealt with this. Yes, you did. Again, to emphasize, I, I, as Dr. Rajan has put it, this is one of the most important aspect of surgeon's life, not to overuse and misuse the antibiotics. The prophylactic antibiotics is like, uh, as I said, holding an umbrella before the rain starts. So if you have hold the umbrella after the rain starts, there is no point to it already wet. So it has to be given at least about 20 to 30 minutes before starting the incision. And it should be given in the appropriate dose according to the body mass index. I also told obese patients may require higher dose. And most often it should be, should not be very high end antibiotics. Most often probably cefuroxime, second generation cephalosporin should be enough. And this should not be used as a therapeutic antibiotic in most of the cases. Keep it as the prophylactic antibiotic in your hospital. The best person to give the prophylactic antibiotic is the anesthetist at the time of induction, because even if you can give in the ward or in the pre-operative room, it can be missed or the surgery can be delayed. So there is no 100% ensuring that the prophylactic antibiotic is given. The surgeon should ask the anesthetist before the skin incision, and also it should be there in the patient safety list whether the prophylactic antibiotic has been given or not. So this is one important thing. And even if you put a mesh or anything, there is absolutely, there is no reason to continue the antibiotic, whether you put a mesh, whether there is a Foley's catheter, whether there is a drain, there is no need to continue the antibiotic post-operatically with only few situations, as I said, if there are multiple interventions on the biliary or pancreatic organ and you are doing a biliary or pancreatic surgery, because of the intervention, they may be infected. You may have to continue post-surgery. Cirrhotic patients, or immunocompromised patient, these are, and most of the time, 48 hours is enough, or 72 hours, not more than that. Even the CDC guidelines earlier said 72 hours, now they say 48 hours is enough. Prophylactic antibiotic, at the maximum you have to give, after that there is no need of these things. As somebody has asked, uh, Dr. Arun Kumar from Katak has said, is there any interaction between antibiotics and anesthetic drugs. And I can go ahead quite boldly and say that there isn't any interaction. There are different groups and different classes of drugs. There is absolutely no con anesthetic contraindication for the use of an antibiotic. There's only one in that where you use aminoglycosides. They have a curare mimetic effect and can affect muscle relaxations. So that is why we prefer to use the cephalosporins as the prophylactic antibiotic. Right, uh, doctor, what would you say about the perioperative oxygen therapy? Uh, that's the word used over here, perioperative oxygen therapy, Dr. Sarvanan from Chennai. Is there any yes. role for increasing the oxygen when you're doing any particular oxygen uh, delivery to the patient? Yeah, I also read about it. See, there is no strong evidence. Even the CDC guidelines are not supporting it. But the advantage of giving perioperative oxygen therapy is it improves the tissue oxygenation, the, the blood supply to, even if there is a little bit of the marginal devitalized tissues, it improves. So this is another effort in the surgeon's hand and also the OT team to see that the uh, surgical site infection reduces. And there is no harm. Most of the patients in the post-operative recovery room, when they are there, you can give the oxygen for another hour or two and then ship the patient. It doesn't do any harm. And it is a good practice to give post or pre, or sorry, perioperative oxygenation to the patient in an effort to reduce the surgical site infection. Um, thank you, doctor. 
Dr. Behera from Sambalpur has asked, do you have any advanced wound care dressings in for the post-operative cover of wound in high-risk patients? Patients who are slightly higher risk, lower immune status, you know, some tissue component or a patient component that may give rise to an infection. Yes. There are uh, many things which are marketed, especially when you are thinking of wound infection chances are higher. There are, there is no great evidence to say this, but there are sandwich dressings, what we call it as, and then collagen dressings, which can use. But the evidence says, if you think there is a great chance of infection in the face, the wound is going to get infected, best is to at present use the negative pressure dressing method that has definite evidence to say that it prevents the surgical site infection. Other things like the sandwich dressing or collagen dressing, all those things are an effort which you can definitely do as the prevention of surgical site infection, but there is no great evidence to suggest that. Thank you, Doctor. Dr. Rakesh Kumar from Raipur says, what is the practice of just abdominal incision Staple closure and leave it to open, no dressing at all. The CDC guideline also says that initial 48 hours or 72 hours, that is the time epithelialization occurs. So that is the time patient may require some amount of dressing. See, one advantage is there may be some amount of oozing and the skin, whatever you put staples or the uh, sutures, epithelialization has not occurred, which takes about 48 hours. Once the epithelialization occurs, there is no great way of uh, the bacteria cannot enter inside that wound. So there is no need of dressing. So it's a good practice and evidence-based practice, recommended practice immediately after the surgery to use dressing at least for 48 hours. Yeah, It just goes on to the principle that to make a dressing water, to make a wound watertight and to prevent moisture getting into the thing. It takes about 48 hours of this epithelization process of the wound healing. And for that, we need to protect the wound from exposure. Um, thank you, Doctor. Uh, what would you say would be Dr. Baskarpai from Bangalore asking the role of suction drains in laparotomy wounds to prevent infection? Would you put a suction drain into every wound? Yes. Inside, inside, there, that is a, a suction drain uh, into the wound area. Subcutaneous area. Subcutaneous area. This uh, again has no great evidence. That's why I didn't uh, bring it. The recent World Journal of Emergency Surgery also, there is a mention about it, but the evidence is weak. But if you have not, if you think there is a dead space, obese patients, and the subcutaneous uh, tissue is huge, we can use subcutaneous drains in that wound region so that there is no collection occurs, there is no seroma occurs, prevention of the surgical site infection. This is another effort we can definitely yes. use. There is no harm in using the suction drain, but remove it as early as possible. It, right. All the drains have can sometimes can bacteria. Cells can cause the bacteria. Go back. Yeah. Right. Some l other little minor points. Dr. Chiranjeevi Kandilwal from uh, Patna has said uh, Are masks and gloves required for laparoscopic surgery? <laughs> <laughs> this corona age, definitely, yes. <laughs> yeah. Both mask is important, gloves also important. See, both these are uh, two-way protection. If you see the history of how the mask came, it is a lot of contamination and infection used to occur for the patient. Even if you are doing laparoscopy also, so there are ports. So yeah, we, there is no great evidence to say that mask is uh, uh, totally prevents that. But it's a good practice, especially now to wear proper mask. And gloves, definitely, yes, it is definitely required. It protects you also and also the patient. Yes. Uh, the, um, the, what is the best 
skin preparation agent you would use or advise doctor dr raj chekar from bangalore um, he is asked is 90% alcohol in skin preparation uh, prep uh, useful um earlier most of the surgeons used betadine or the povidone iodine and the spirit the evidence at present is more towards chlorhexidine or uh, gluconate so that is the one which is universally recommended both for the patient preparation and also the hand scrub so i enumerated lot of advantages of the using the chlorhexidine gluconate it has the longer residual activity than the povidone iodine and then it can be when the blood or other body proteins mix it the activity doesn't come down the longer duration of activity and also it gives much better activity residual activity than all other available uh, antibacterial antimicrobial solution especially alcohol nowadays not used it's either povidone iodine 7.5 percent or it is the chlorhex gluconate yeah it's ch lastly there's one about the type of ot in which you do surgery yes it is very nice to have the lamella flow hepa filtered and really controlled zoned ot in which there are uh, septic zone a uh, protective zone clean zone and an aseptic zone in which you know that is all the ideal situation but most hospitals have a room in a house which is converted into a hot ot in smaller nursing homes and other places can you just explain a cleaning routine which would be useful for these people as a guide to keep their infection rates down yeah see i think operation theater is like the temple for the surgeon so you should not compromise on this but many things are not under our control we go and operate somewhere and come back but it's very important that the operation theater should be very sterile and prevention of infection one of the most important thing which you have to ask when you operate is most of the operation theaters now have ac but the number of air exchanges which occur because with each air exchanges there is uh, the all the air from the ot goes outside and the fresh air comes inside with the hepa filtered air so that is one thing which is very important to prevent the surgical site infection and also other infections inside the ot otherwise the routine cleaning and the sterilization of the equipment ot environment all the things are very important that itself is a big another chapter the ot uh, all the necessary things in the ot for the prevention of surgical site infection but more than that all the things what we have discussed which are our under our control i think we should very very importantly do that yeah and now just to close up there's one final question which has come from uh, uh, dr saik from who says when a surgery goes beyond a certain limit of time is there a role for a second dose of prophylactic antibiotic or yeah. another part is if you find that the wound has become contaminated is there a role for increasing the antibiotic um, uh, that has been uh, administered yes see these are two situations i said that the repeat dose of antibiotic as per the guidelines is required if the surgery prolongs more than 3 hours okay so this is the indication you have to give to the anesthetist at the beginning of the operation major operation that if the surgery is going beyond 3 hours please give antibiotic redose of the same antibiotic at the end of 3 hours so that is very important also another situation where we do redosing of antibiotic is there is a massive blood loss and the, whatever antibiotic was given at the time of induction it's lost in this blood again we have to give 
antibiotic for these patients if there is a massive blood loss. If there is a contamination during surgery, like the bubble gets opened and it gets sore or anything, then we have, we'd say, we are converting a clean contaminated wound into a contaminated wound. So there probably you have to con consider therapeutic antibiotics, not just prophylactic antibiotics. So what we are talking in all these prophylaxis is clean wound and clean contaminated wound. Contaminated wound and the dirty wound, they anyway require therapeutic dose of antibiotics. Well, I think Dr. Shivaram has given us a nice exposition of surgical site infection uh, in this last hour. And we are indeed grateful to you, Dr. Shivaram, for a very clear um, understanding that you have trans uh, conveyed to our viewers. In closing remarks, I would like to say that there are three indices of how good a surgical service is running. And I've been in the administrator chair, so I know I look at wound infection rates. There is a particular index that we see how many cases have been got infected over the number of cases that have been done in a given period of time. And we can assess our sterility, our sterile procedures, and our other efficiencies of function. Second is a very important one, which is called the length of stay. Every wound infection that is of a deeper nature that has resulted from a surgical site infection automatically increases length of stay. And that is bad for the hospital. You have a bed occupied by an infected patient preventing another good patient from coming in. And that is not good for the whole circle and cycle of patient rotation. And lastly, we have one very important one called the reoperative rate. How many times do you go back into the uh, patient for clearing up something that was induced by the surgical procedure? So these are all indices which tell us surgical site infection is something that can be preventable and can be kept at low levels or nil levels if we take the due precautions and methods to prevent them from occurring. I again thank Zaidis Fortis for giving us this lovely opportunity to discuss an important topic and uh, with that i think i thank the viewers for being with us and uh, i hand over back to dr aishwarya who will conclude this evening session thanks dr shivram i think that was brilliant thank you very very much excellent thank you sir it was indeed a privilege to learn from both of you i have got the count of the number of viewers we have we have around 500 plus viewers who are listening to us today and a lot of questions, a lot of engagement. I want to thank both of you again. We hope to see you soon and learn from you again, sir. Thank, thank you, sir. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Zaidas Fort is our team. I thank everybody. I hope this lecture will help a lot of people to understand this prevent problem and prevent surgical site infection and the patient suffering. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.